Okay, so I guess we're at least broadcasting. Uh, the other thing is, uh, what about microphone with yours? Like, is, are people actually going to be able to hear you on, on yours? On mine? Yeah. I, I don't know. We need to, should test it. Uh, I have a... Uh, Oh, I can hear you. You can? Testing. One, two, three. And what if I'm over here or do is that okay? Can you still hear yeah. me? All right. Good. This is a test. And my my microphone is off, so it's not giving it for mine. So it's this is a test. Recording. Testing. One, two, three. Uh, how's the gain? Is the gain okay or should it raise it? <laughs> this is a test of the emergency All right this is really weird streaming I mean, I'm, system I'm hearing it over and over again uh, so we've got like right so there's some sort of feedback loop. it's like a, a feedback like a, a delayed feedback loop. oh man it's yeah it's constantly streaming it, it's because of yours do you have yours on mute I had mine on mute uh, let me Completely yeah. mute it. All right. You, you want to listen? This is a test of the emergency streaming. So, oh, we have to wait for the other to calm down. Yeah. The feedback loop. Had this been an actual presentation, it no, would have said start, something meaningful. No, it's starting over again. It is? Yeah. All right. Let me try to... Uh, So I want my microphone on. It says silence, and that's because I'm on mute for sound. Do, do you have your microphone off? Uh, well, I have mine mute. Well, and I, I, right, so you have it on mute, so the microphone's off. There we go. Okay. There's a delay, that's all right, as long as we're not in the same room. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it there, it's taking like a, a feedback of us like over and over again. You don't hear that? I'm just, no, all right, it's just on mine. Oh, it's That's repeating. Weird. Oh, because it's it's repeating what's on the Hangout, and I have no idea. As long as they don't hear a repeat, that's fine. <laughs> well, it doesn't seem to be. Problem is, if anyone other than the two of you speak, nobody else, they, they can't hear us. So if we speak, it's not looping. No, it's not looping. Okay, so it's just on mine that was looping. Would you be able to edit this after the fact and like cut out the beginning of it? No, well, I could download. I guess I could download, download it, it and, then, and then you have to re-upload it. Oh, that's a pain. No, Pe people can skip ahead. No, I think the you want to change it. Okay. We'll just make that announcement. It's like if you want to watch this, skip ten minutes ahead. <laughs> We had some technical difficulties. There's nobody watching this one person. Yeah. <laughs>
so so much much for sending out to all of Nielsen. I know, right? Nielsen's like yeah. Gem Spock, what? Is this from Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> no, like, that, that, that's, that's I, I Star know, Trek. I would, like, that's Spock, right? Yeah, it's a blogging prospect. It's a more logical way. But if you say Star Wars, Star Trek people don't get it. Yeah. Yeah, I think people don't like it. Yes, too. Well, especially when you get one of uh, people who really like one and not the other, no, and vice versa. I like both of them, so. <laughs> Except for the prequels. Where do you, you like the new get the sword? Uh, I got them at Spring One Two GX uh, I think three years ago, oh. and I, I, I basically I bring them to every meetup. It's like, hey, here, take as many as you like, and I, I, I've had it for I don't know how long. Like I did that when I came back from the conference. It's like I put a whole bunch out, and it's like. Because, you know, basically at the conference, it's like, yeah, I'll pick up like a handful. Or I was like, yeah, there's still a whole bunch there. I'll pick up another handful. And I had like a whole bunch of it for a while. All right, let's see. The category that you are broadcasting this in. It's called how to and style. Because it's stylish. <laughs> <laughs> how is the coconut one? Is it good? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's like coconut. What is that? This? This one? Juice? 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 Have my phone, you know, call. You'll hear, you'll hear Double Dragon. Double Dragon? Uh, Nintendo game. Oh, really? For the music? <laughs> it's really loud and annoying. <laughs> my parents call, you'll yeah. hear Mark. Should we, should we check to see? Yeah. Uh, I did put it put it on the meetup, but should should we just say well, well, should you we know, just write our number on that say that call this number? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that would be an idea. That would, might be a little better yeah. in case they don't know the look. Twenty-five lines. Or thirty figures. I've drank from that. I don't think. I spent it in order. Thirty lines. And if you want, uh, I just want ten schools. Follow the sign around the time. Yeah. Way more than. No, twenty to thirty. But that Mirinda and all that. What that? Fanta has about thirty feet. It is one friend that has it for Hi, how are you? Okay, <laughs> good. Let's say hi first. I think the rest of Oh, what'd you do? Sorry, <laughs> you broke the presentation. I think so. Oh, there it is. I, I was trying something else. I tried Slide Master. Oh yeah, the master. Notes not master. Outline. Yeah, there, there's some weird things about his laptop, and it's like I didn't bring my HDMI converter, so it's on his laptop. But it's just for the announcement, so yeah, th this is big enough. You it's should not, should be okay. Yeah. All right. Did you want to uh, dig over? Uh, we'll give it a couple more minutes until everyone's back out here because there's a few people who want to okay. get pizza. So.
and I don't see anyone online. I don't know why we hired you. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I'm sure you have. How's uh, the, the latest? I haven't upgraded yet. Yeah. It's good. All right. So then I'm going to do it. I like the cats. The cats? You don't know the cats? There's a hidden Easter egg. Oh, okay. Oh, there's an Easter egg in yeah. it? In what? Which version? In the uh, seventh. New Year. New Year. Oh, yeah. And there are these cats that okay. you have to collect. I, what is I have two Note 7s. Does anybody want notes? <laughs> you no, know, we, we have next. We, we, we should keep a fire extinguisher. Hey, uh, you get to see jobs in Amazon's website, right? Have you seen a photo phone in Amazon? If you get a photo phone in Amazon, you'll get all kinds of dogs. There are cool Google Hangouts. There's a lot of these type of You can have a rainbow phone. Do you have an idea? company just sort of new it? No, right? No. It's, I mean, the, I home button, Google, the home button is not new assistant. Right? The home button is not, but I have the Google Assistant actually. That's there. The, there's a, oh, through uh, Arrow. Through Arrow, okay. Through Arrow. Yeah, no, it's so because the only reason I would buy, buy, to buy Pixel is for Google Assistant. And if they say that the Google Assistant is going to come just out of you guys, not everybody So that's what they want to promote that. Yeah. And therefore, yeah. otherwise, there's no point, right? Okay. Your phone doesn't get any share. You know, I'm All right. So we're gonna start. Uh, basically, I'm just gonna go over a few announcements for the group in general. Um, basically, if we could go to next slide. Uh, speakers. So if anybody is interested in giving a talk on anything Ruby Grail Spring related, uh, we would love to have you. So, uh, you know, contact me or, you know, the meetup and we'll see where we go for that. Uh, next, I'd like to thank Nielsen for giving us the space, uh, pizza, beer, and refreshments. Uh, it's always good. Uh, so next one. Uh, G3 Summit is coming up uh, the end of next month. So this is going to be one of the bigger Groovy and Grails uh, uh, conferences. I'm going to be going to it, so I'm going to see if I can do a little uh, video while I'm there. People, you know, see if I can get some stuff. So uh, if you're thinking about going, uh, I hope you've already bought tickets because now it's, it's gone up in price, but uh, it's definitely a good one to go to. Uh, yeah, it's going to be in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, another thing that has come up just recently is Groovy uh, released its own Slack channel. So if you want to ask Groovy questions, uh, sign up for this Slack channel. It's a good place. Like pretty much everyone from the Groovy community uh, congregates there. There's also a Grails one if you haven't signed up for that one already. Uh, but they might eventually move to the Groovy community and just have one. Uh, but it's but everyone who makes Ruby and Grails is on there. So you know if you know uh, like uh, yeah. Guillaume, uh, Guillaume's on there, uh, Cedric, uh, you know Kurt back with Graham, Jeff Scott Brown, all the big names are on there. So you can have, bug them and ask questions. But don't become too annoying where you you will get kicked off because there was one incident. Okay. Uh, so uh, next, just to give you. Uh, like some major things that happened uh, more recently, Grails uh, 3.2.1 came out uh, came out recently. Plus, uh, there's also uh, Grails Diary, which is a, a really good place just to look for 
uh, uh, Ruby and Grails news. Uh, it comes out probably about every week or every other week. So it's a good place just to find out like what plugins have been released for Grails. Uh, they put up interesting tweets, blogs, uh, you know, videos, you name it. So, and uh, I think that's pretty much it. Unless anyone else has any announcements from the floor, and silence. So uh, it's off to you then, Rob. All right. It's all to you. Thank you. Okay. Let's see if this is going to. It's still streaming the other thing. Right. Yeah, it'll catch up. That's not working. All right, I'll just have to do it from here. I'm Ralph Navarro, and I have been doing test automation since about 1999. That was when I first got excited with doing it. I created a, um, does anyone know Lotus Notes? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I, I use Lotus Notes to test Lotus Script on Lotus Notes, but against the server, the Domino server, which was an AS400 system. And you do, do I need a clicker? Yeah. On the presentation. Uh, and actually, it, it's still uh, not streaming this one. It's streaming the other one. It's streaming? The other presentation. Oh, 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 oh. Just so you know. Yeah. So that means I have to. Go back to Google Hangouts. We are experiencing user difficulties. Please stand by. All right. Yeah. There it is. Oh, that's chat. Yeah. Come on. There it is. That's it. And I want this one. There you go. Okay. Uh, well, let's see if it works. Uh -oh. Uh oh, we lost there. It is. It's back. Yeah, because it was just a temporary. So. Yep. Okay. Hopefully. Hey, cool. Thank you. It works. All right. Where was I? Well, oh, yeah. AS400. Yeah, so AS400. So I took the, what I did was I modeled what it was I wanted to test, which was all the Lotus. And if you know Lotus Script, it's a lot like Visual Basic, right? So it, it's testing all the functional work on the Domino server, which is on the AS400. So what I did was model that in Lotus Notes, and, I, and a, a basic object has properties and methods, right? So a form has properties as fields, and methods are buttons that you can put scripts in. So using that, I modeled a test as being this thing that you could drop down and pick connections, and it would, which server did you want to test against? You could stick the test in there in a field and the test would have would be like a template, and that template would be uh, would have uh, get information from other fields, from other documents, and you could just click a button, and it would take that script, fill in the template, send it to the server, execute it, or first compile it, execute it, and then return the results back into another field within the same document. And and then in the notes v remark in red x so i could run one test or a thousand tests and uh just execute it right from the notes client and hitting the server and do tests against the server and have it come back so that was my claim to fame back then and then i helped the team 
use that methodology for Java API testing, C++ API testing, um, search engine testing, doing that same method using Lotus Notes in order to test features on the Domino server. So uh, that, that was way back then. Let's uh, move to today. Now, I had been looking for uh, throughout the years with each project that I worked on, I've tried to simplify the automation of testing in the most efficient and, and do testing in the most efficient way possible. And and I feel that Jeb is really it, it's it's there. It's as close as I think you're going to get. Um, so that's, but in order to do it and actually make it work, there's a bunch of pieces that has to come together. You can get me, by the way, this is my, the slides are up on GitHub. Um, uh, I've got a repository there and the Docker files, the, um, the setup, it's all, it's all there on GitHub. Um, and by the way, if you're having difficulty with something there, uh, like I was thinking of including a little bit more information in the in the Jeb uh, in the uh, GitHub main page, the readme.md. Uh, excuse me, good pizza. Um, <laughs> feel free to give me a call. Uh, my Uh, if you wake me up, you deserve to talk to me. <laughs> so go ahead and, and uh, give me a call. Don't be shy. Um, and, and contact me. I'll, I'll do my best to answer your question. Jeb to Grid. So this, is, this talk is about taking Jeb and having it run against a Selenium Grid. Um, and we'll get into all the different pieces. So we'll talk first about the problem and then a little bit about Groovy. So I'm just getting things really quickly. It's only one evening. I'm not gonna go too much into detail, but we'll, we'll do demos at the end and show you that it's working. Uh-oh, it's not streaming, which is, we may have this problem intermittently as we go by. So bear with me. All right, hold on. I'm trying to find the. It is streaming. Uh, I see you. So you're not. So this. That's what I'm seeing, but I don't know if this is this is supposed to be the live page. Yeah. So let me switch again and see if uh, if I have to reshare. I think we have to do this every once in a while. Yep. There it goes. What? You're getting it. Yep. It's uh, doing the live. Oh, part. wrong one. This one. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's behind it all. It should come back up. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. So we're going to talk about the problem. We're going to talk about Groovy. Uh, what it is. I think you guys may already know it. It's fine. Uh, if I if I go a little bit too basic, there for if you use it. All right. Yeah. Um. How many people? One, two. Okay. Um, a little bit about Selenium, how it fits into the whole thing. We're, and we're back to none. Does that mean it's. That, what did you do? I just went like this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, stay in that position. <laughs> we, we just need. Uh, you have your. It, you know, an antenna and some tinfoil. Right, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, a little bit about Selenium and Jeb. On the second half, we'll talk about Docker, the benefits of that using Docker Compose, 
and Selenium Grid, uh, putting it all together, and we'll have Q&A afterwards. Did you have a question? I saw your hand raised. Me? No. Oh. No, I, I just went like that. All right. So the problem. Um, here's a simplified software development lifecycle. Um, very simple. You all know this. Uh, step one, create requirements, right? Step two, develop code. Step three, test to verify the code works against the requirements, pass or fail. Step four, repeat two and three until all requirements are met. Step five, send it off to production, right? Jeb to grid problem. When testing your web application against a browser, manual testing is too slow. Now this is the problem Jeb to grid solves, or that Jeb solves. And one tester only can work with one browser at a time. Uh, although I do know some people who are like ambidextrous and work on multiple multiple windows. And, um, we need a way to automate testing and to test against many browsers and to be able to test in parallel, be able to run a suite of tests overnight, right? So. Here's a typical requirement, a use case of logging. When the user navigates to the login page, then the login page is displayed. When the user provides valid admin credentials and clicks on the login button, then user is taken to admin page. Now, this is not Jeb. This is Selenium. And it's a little bit more verbose than the So the problem, automated web test developer is similar to application development effort. What we did to code for features are things that have to be coded in an automation way to be able to manipulate the product in those, in those features. Yeah, we lost it. We lost it again. <clears throat> This time, my, my magic hand is. Oh, <laughs> oh, look at that. Okay. Here the camera needs to have some action. I don't know. I tell you, just stand yeah. right there. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm always doing. Or just move, yeah, keeping it live, not letting it go to sleep. Could be something with the maybe. Okay, and it could be on this end too. Keep it on that. So, wouldn't it be great if tests could all the requirements? And how can we improve test production efficiency? So, let's talk a little bit about some of the, this other technology, Groovy. The design goals for Groovy, that's what they wanted to do. Have scripting and testing capabilities, write concise and maintainable tests, builds, and automation. And it, there's a smooth Java integration. So that means everything, all the Java jars, the wealth of Java information, I, you know, and I don't. Uh, And Python's great, don't get me wrong. You can do a lot with Python. But Java's had a head start, right? It's a little bit more mature, a lot more mature than, than Python is. And for so for full development um, enterprise software, Java's really the way to go, right? And there's
it's 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 just something up on the wall. It sounds like yeah. Can you can you try okay. to okay. recreate other hot spot through the mobile? I reconnected. Uh oops. You want to try another network? You have another network? Yeah. yeah. Let, let, well, let's, let's him see. try the other network. All right. Because yeah. mine's yep. not important. His is. Yeah. Uh, Which one? Cool iPhone. Yeah. This one? Yeah. And that has three bars, so that might work a little better. All right, is it working? Yeah, and I think the live will catch up. Okay. <coughs> there we go. All right. Great, thank you. So, features Groovy has closures, builders, runtime and compile time metaprogramming, and the ability to create and author domain specific languages. Closures. A closure in Groovy is an open, anonymous block of code. It can take arguments, it can return a value, and it can be assigned to a value. So think about that. It's code that can be assigned to a value, to a variable, excuse me. It may, you may reference variables in its surrounding scope and can also contain free variables defined outside of its surrounding scope. So here's an example groovy closure. I've got a little array of numbers, <clears throat> dot each, and I'm passing the uh, print it inside the closure, and the output, what it does is it will iterate through each of the elements and do whatever's inside the closure. That could be one line, it could be a number of lines. It is the default for for that object, for that for that item in the collection. Builders. Builders simplify the creation of data structures. It includes things like the JSON builder, the markup builder, right out of the box. Or you can build your own builder. So here's a, a JSON builder example. Def JSON equals new groovy.json.json builder. So we create, we instantiate it. JSON name colon dm age 33. Of course, I think he's older now. <laughs> Assert json.toString equals, and we can easily get the elements inside the JSON object makes it kind of easy to get to individual elements or the whole the whole thing. Runtime and compile time metaprogramming. Metaprogramming adds met you can add methods to classes or objects dynamically at runtime. That includes Java classes or final Java classes. And it comes with built-in methods or or you can add your own. So you can take an object or a class and add additional features to it during runtime. Add additional methods. So here's a little example. There's a string, and normally it would just be a string, right? But you can convert that string to a URL and then get the text off of that URL. So What's happening here? And, and what it will return is the text of the Google homepage, right? So it's automatically doing an HTTP client, and it's going off, it's interpreting that URL as, a, as, a, as something that the HTTP client needs to do, go out, navigate to it, get the text, bring it back, and now you can do something with it, and all within 
two methods attached to the object. Domain specific language authoring. The DSL. DSL is a mini language aiming at representing constructs for a given domain. Thanks to Fergal Dierl, Dierl, um, who wrote Groovy for domain specific languages. I found that this to be uh, a really good definition of what a domain specific language is. Spock and Jeb are those mini languages, thanks to Groovy. It's Groovy that has made it possible to create these other domain specific languages. Now getting started, how do you get started in just playing around with this stuff, right? If you haven't already, you could go to Groovy, you could download the latest Groovy and you could use it, all right? What you'll find over time is that you might need a different version. There might be some dependencies. You might need something else. Uh, so you could end up playing, a, a, or maybe you want to use a different version for some reason, not do the latest version. Um, SDK Man used to be called the Groovy Version Manager, who actually came from and was patterned after the Ruby Version Manager, RVM. SDK man simplifies Groovy install and not just Groovy. You can also do things like Verdex, uh, Spring Boot, um, a number of other things. Uh, um, and Grails, Grails Scala, Scala, yeah. uh, Gradle, Gradle, Kotlin, Gradle. Mm -hmm. or Kotlin. Uh, it makes it very easy yeah. to install all these different packages. And to get it, you know, all you need is a bash shell. And you do a curl to this URL and pipe it to bash, and it'll execute the script right from that page and install itself into your .bash RC. And it'll be at the very end of your .bash RC file. So you want to make sure that you don't add things to the end of that. The end of your bash RC file, .bash RC file, becomes your um, devoted to really just SDK man. And then you can just either resource uh, in order to get it into that session or just open up a new session, you'll automatically have SDK man in your bash. Another thing to help, once you get Groovy installed, and all you have to do is say Groovy install, or I'm sorry, SDK install Groovy, and you'll get the latest Groovy. SDK <laughs> list Groovy and you'll see all the versions of Groovy that are available. And you'll get a little star, a little a, a little star, I think, next to the one that's installed. And you can have multiple ones installed. Once you have Groovy installed, you could you could run this with the Groovy console. Just type Groovy console, all one word, with a capital C uh, for console. And up pops this Groovy console where you can enter code in, and experiment, try things out. It's real easy. Spock. Oh, do you want do you want CSDK in action or do you think you're good? All right. Spock. A more logical way to test. Live long and prosper. Has JUnit runner? And it's a highly expressive specification language. This is the basic set of blocks and phases that are taken care of by those blocks. In Spock, we have, is there a laser pointer in this? Yeah. There is? Yeah, but I don't think it from the glass. You can point it on the block. Yes. No. If you were in presentation mode, you would probably. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah you can't see it on glass. All right. Anyway, I'll do it old fashioned. <laughs> Set up. Oh, how's it streaming, by the way? It uh, it's streaming. Okay. Yeah. Set up. When, then. When is the actions that you want to do against something? Then are the assertions 
or the verifications that those actions have done what you expected them to do. Expect. So they're set up in phases of setup, stimulus, response, and each of these take up a, a, a part of each of those phases. Clean up. And then where, and this arrow that goes all the way around where, where is a data-driven model. It, it allows you to do all of these things, but do them iterating through a set of parameters that you want to give it. And you could give it um, a table. You can give it a just a uh, list of items. And it will iterate through the specification with those those things change so you can create data-driven tests. Groovy class is a, a specification is a groovy class. It extends from Spocklang specification. And the name that you give that class should relate to system or the system operation. It instructs JUnit to run the specification using Sputnik. So here's a just a template, little little stub of a specification. We've got class, my first specification, extend specification. And we have inside that specification, we can have fields, fixture methods, feature methods, and helper methods. Feel free to correct me if I <laughs> I may I may make a mistake on purpose, so <laughs> Fields, they store objects, they belong to the fixture. You initialize, or they get initialized at declaration. Um, they're not shared between feature methods. Every feature method gets its own object. And if you want to share it, you can just use the annotation at shared. Fixture methods. So your fixture methods are basically your setup and your cleanup. And it's how you're going to be doing that. Run before every feature method. You'll you'll have a setup fixture method. Uh, run after every feature method. You'll do a cleanup. Uh, and if you want to run before the first feature method within the specification, you do setup spec and cleanup spec. It's pretty self-explanatory. Feature methods. This is the heart of your test. Heart of <laughs> of the specification. Describes the features, the properties, or aspects that is expected to be in the system under specification. It's named with string literals. So go ahead and use pushing an element on the stack. <clears throat> go ahead and use a sentence to describe a method of what it is you're trying to do. And make it readable in human language right it doesn't have to be camel case it can actually have spaces in it right this i i thought was awesome and you put blocks inside so there are four phases set up the fe features fixture which is optional and that's that setup that we talked about for the fixture. provide a stimulus to the system under specification actually making an action, doing something. Describe the response expected from the system. And finally, clean up the features fixture, which is optional as well. Helper methods. They're made so that gives you extra flexibility. Let's say you want to create something that's, that's just to help along some additional method that you want to use to do something within that feature method, you can do it here. It can help with setup and cleanup logic or for complex conditions that you want to take care of. So here's a sample, uh, including a help, helper method. I don't know if you can read this, uh, but I've got def um, defined offered PC matches preferred configuration. So that's my spec, that's uh, the feature method. When, 
debt. So here's the action. We're going to define PC equals shop dot buy PC. And we're running that, that function off the shop. Then matches preferred configuration PC. So let's say we have a complex set of things. We could have included all that in the then, but it also makes the code much easier to read because uh, we're doing we're doing assertion on the PC vendor asserts to being sunny, and PC clock rate is greater equal to two three three three. PC RAM is greater than or equal to 494096, and PC.OS equals Linux. Notice that there are ampersand signs here. That it wasn't just one underneath the other. And there's a reason for that. In Groovy, the last thing that gets returned is what? You know? In a, so there's, notice there's no return statement. But the last thing in there is what will get returned, right? So if you only had these, and and there'll be booleans that would get returned for each one of these, and you didn't have the ampersand, only the last one would get returned. So you have to keep that in mind as to how it's work. It works, right? Um, there's a lot of default, you know, groovy will take things for granted in a certain way. And so you need to, um, you know, go through, there's a document out there on Groovy syntax, which gives best practices. So that it's a, it's an easy read and it shows you all the little things like Groovy truths. Um, in Groovy, you, you know about Java in, in Groovy, there's uh, what's called Groovy truths. You don't need to worry so much about null pointer exceptions like you do in Java. And the reason is in Groovy, a null is just considered false. So you can take care of code and, and handle the code with it even if it doesn't exist. You don't have to check to see if it doesn't exist. You can just go through the flow of the code and, and just handle it as it being false. <clears throat> Spock, if you want to play with Spock, there's a Spock web console. And by the way, this code is on GitHub as well. So you could download it, uh, compile it and execute it and create a uh, Spock web console locally. But I'd recommend just using it right off the web. And you could try your code in Spock and stick it right in there and uh, click on run script from the actions and you'll be able to execute the Spock script right there on the web. It's nice, quick and easy. And I can show that to you, which I have if everything's working. So, You know what? We're, uh, oh, but it says I am screen sharing. So yeah, I think still, I'm, I'm doing good. The, uh, right. So what I need to do here is the Spock web console. Uh, but first I need to share the browser. All right. In my mouse, there it is. That's the one. Yeah. There we go. And so now if I come here. So here's um my first spec extend specification def let's try this uh list is set with five elements mm -hmm. we set the list you want to hit the control plus a couple of times just to zoom in. uh to zoom in yeah how's that okay and then i can just hit so uh list size is five and i'm going to make this so 
it's going to fail. All right. Run script. And this is what a failure looks like. Condition not satisfied. List.size. It's very JUnit like. Uh, we've got, it shows us the list and the data for it, what the size value is. We can see what it's on the other side. And it's, you know, we can have, you know, a complex set over here and it will it will run through all that and it shows us that it's false um the true was kind of boring it just doesn't show anything because it worked <laughs> so um spock web console let's go back the presentation uh, did we are we um, I think will, I may it will catch up it's okay or I hope yeah there it is all right good so selenium selenium automates browsers it uses the web driver interface. And these are all the languages on the top that Selenium will understand. These are all the browsers that Selenium will handle. Android, Chrome, Eclipse. What's the compass? Safari. Yeah? Safari, yeah. All right. And at the bottom, the operating systems, Android, Apple, or iOS, Linux, Windows. Oh, the Mac is what. Jeb, the history of Jeb. Jeb started, well, first it was Selenium, and that started back in 2004. In 2006, we had WebDriver which was an improvement. It started to become a standard. Um, and it's still in, uh, as I understand, uh, re uh, request to be to be a standard. In 2009, Selenium and WebDriver combined. And in 2010, we've got Jeb. Now in the early days of Jeb, Jeb was really hard to use. Uh, it was difficult because there were dependencies and there were conflicts in some of those dependencies of the jars and trying to set up the Gradle environment was very difficult. Today, it's a lot easier. Jeb uses WebDriver and it's that DSL. It's another language that simplifies the coding of Selenium. It leverages the WebDriver interface just like Selenium does. The WebDriver is a remote control interface, allows you to manipulate web pages. You can get components from that page. You can access components using the document object model. And you use CSS path in order to get to that. And it's just a hierarchical tree. And you're traversing down the tree to get to those components. It enables user agent introspection and control. You can even use Jeb for um, web scraping. Working draft of the web driver for the W3C is at that link. And here's that requirement again that we talked about earlier, the use case. When the user navigates to the login page, then the login page is displayed. When the user provides valid admin credentials and clicks on login button, then the user is taken to the admin page. So Jeb, Spock and Jeb log in. Um, here's a sample page object. We've got import Jeb.page. We've got a login page, extends page. Page is a Jeb class. And there are three parts to that. And this is all part of the DSL. There's a static URL, 
which is where that page is actually located. There's an at, and that's a closure. And that can be one or more assertions. And it's one or more assertions that verify you're at that page, right? How do you know you're at that page? When you go to the page, you want to check it. And you could do it as simple as having one, or you can have a whole list of them. And it will go through all of them in order to verify that you're at that page. Static content. These are handles that you name to objects that are of importance on the page, right? So let's say um, in this particular case, we've got the heading. Uh, we want to make sure that our, our heading.txt is correct and it says please log in. We know we're at our login page. The login form. So this is the CSS selector and we're going to a an ID that's on that page called login-form. And then there's a login button and we're going to, after we click on that button, we're going to be taken to the admin page and we can verify that and we can put that information in there and it will verify that you've gone to that page and login form dot login is the login button so here's the test itself the specification login spec extends jeb reporting spec admin logs in with valid credentials when to login page. You know what that does? It takes the it takes the web browser and navigates to your login page. Exactly right. The URL. The URL that was in the page object model. Then at login page. What does that mean? Can you guess? It verifies your login. It verifies that you're at the login page. So what was in the at section? <coughs> the at closure, it's going to go through and verify that you're in the you're at the login page. Then or when login form dot username, it's as simple as that, equals Iron Man. I like Iron Man. Login form dot password equals Jarvis. Login button dot click. It's really simple. You can read it. It's in English, <laughs> right? Then we're at the admin page. <coughs> it's that simple. This is not Jeb. This is the. This is a very similar login. The friend sent to me. I said I need a simple login. You log in. You just give credentials. You go to a page. That's it. Give it to me in Selenium. This is what he gave me. And he said this was taken from actual code. He modified it a little bit. So um, <clears throat> you wouldn't know what it is. But this is one, two, three pages of a lot of text in Selenium to do the exact same thing that we did in two very simple pages. One the description of the page that models the page. And then we reuse that in the actual test itself and the test aligned with the requirements of what we wanted. With Jeb, less code is more. And this is where we take a break. Do we take a break? Uh, or do we you can. want to keep going? What do you guys want to do? It's up to the audience. How many more do you need a minute? Go to the bathroom. How much longer? How much longer? Well, we're halfway through, um, and then I want just want to do some demos because we've got the Selenium grid. I'm going to set. It, I'm going to talk a little bit about Docker, and uh, it should go a little bit faster. In a second. What's that? Can you maximize the PowerPoint? Maximize the PowerPoint. Yeah, full screen. We tried to yeah, do a full it, screen, and it was giving us a problem. So. Yeah, I just want to add this. Okay, go ahead. Can you plug it in? Is that uh, no, no, it's over here. Uh, oh, you can keep it on.
Yeah, you can just plug into mine. Mine. We need help. I've only got two. Uh, let's see. I got plenty. So. There we go. How you doing? I'm okay. How you doing? Good. You still at Flingo? No? Long gone. Long gone? Yeah, they were fired. Oh, yeah. With uh, Nuance? Yeah. Uh, I did some nice work with Chad doing uh, connecting the sauce labs. Oh, yeah? That way I could have, um, oh, a Selenium grid right on the, uh, on the cloud. Uh -huh. right. And that way we didn't have to have all the hardware we could test on iPhones and right. Android right. and different operating systems. Right. It's, it's so easy because once you have the access on the you know, web driver, you're there. Let's just establish a connection. Oh, you got to tell them. It's true. It, it's true. I'll tell them. <laughs> That's my one uh, one experience with Jeff. Yeah, how long ago did I tell you about it? It was was that like 2013, 2012? Yeah, yeah, about four years ago. Yeah, I didn't do this at the new on the 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 Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Nice. Right. I'll learn Jeb. Yeah. I don't know. I had taken uh, for a website uh, wrote using Jeb uh, 700. So they, they had all their specs written out in a, in a CSV file, right? That's a spreadsheet. Oh. And so I took the spreadsheet, used the CSV slurper, slurped up the, and auto generated the stubs with all the information from the spreadsheet into the stubs. So I had a stubs directory with all the 750 uh, use cases all written down. And then. Um, I, I wrote out about forty or fifty of them um, and put them into a test uh, package, and you know, and uh, then packaged the whole thing as a virtual client, sent it over to Sri Lanka, and then trained Sri Lankan engineers probably to to do the rest of the right, to maintain and add, uh, you know, the details to the, to each of the stuff. That's right. So yeah, yeah. So I and that level of organization allows you to do that. Right? Yes. Yeah. It's, I mean, the first the first part is I didn't understand. It's like, what is this cat when the, I, I don't understand? Right. This, and it just drove me nuts. And I, I you know I read every bloody web page I could find. I, I Jebish uh, or right. yeah, and, oh Jebish, right? And then I, I just looked up all every Jeb test that I've been written to date, and I, I just tried to read them. The problem is they're written by one person, and not the person. Yeah. They're by another person. Yeah. Well, much better in the language. Right. And third person went in and hacked to right. get things going. But this is not right. So right. it will actually highlight yeah. it properly. Uh, there. So it's it's actually just perfect. Perfect. that that's is very well, important. Once I started it has, getting it, its own oh my God. Standards. Right. So they have yeah. a cool. Uh, G DSL, cool. I love it. And they're in success. I never never learned how to use Grab. I never learned how to use I mean, I learned enough Groovy to get myself going, but I know no Grails. It's like, I really should so learn this because it's fantastic, right. but I don't have time. I should bring more tests. I should bring more tests. Yeah. Yeah. So the Jeb example uh, Gradle yeah, yeah. project yeah. on GitHub, yeah. that's yeah. what made it so much easier. Because the Gradle build is already there, and then I use that and extend it. So then I started adding to the I provided So I have a question for you about SDK. About what? The SDK, man. Okay. 
Is that like a major security risk running through Bash? I know you're not doing it as root, but well, just like, no, it's only for the user, right? Right. So it's it's not, I'm saying you're not doing it's all, all installing but, locally. But everything you have access to, you have access to now. Well, it all understand my view. Well, if I, I didn't go into the script is there, and you can take a look at it. If you felt that there was a security risk, you just have to look at the script and see what what it's. Probably wouldn't know that's after the fact. And it's the same with any. Um, open source software, right? I mean, you download open source software. I do, and I install it. But every the day. reason the source is available is that you can look at it and make a decision. And, you know, and, I do and if there, you have to trust the sources, right? At some point, I just have to say, all right, I, 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 if you want to use it, does anyone trust Microsoft to do it? Do you trust Apple to audit their software? Yeah. The Sun OS ever get audited? And yeah, how do you know whether they're doing the right well, thing or not? What is the right thing? That's the tough no part. Is, right? There's no way to know. As soon as I saw your name on the top side. There is support for good. I'm glad you came. Yeah, well, no. But I'm willing to that. I still love that. But I haven't tried it yet because I... Oh, by heart. Oh, the YouTube by heart. Oh, yes, I love so the thing. So she got me turned on to the, the Tau Manifesto. Yes. I, I mean, wrong. yes, I is wrong. I is wrong. I mean, I can just trust you completely on the market. If you want to keep her. You're listening to her weird now, music. Now, her her yeah. weird music but stuff. But if you she want to a little bit. Yeah, a separate thread, which is music. And there was some sort of presentation that she gave yeah, and she went no. But you know um, with, 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 our, okay. with our company we just hoping to say yes we can buy it. Oh wait. Shall we wait or start or uh, I can tell them uh, that we're stuck okay. so I'll be right back. All right. How are we doing for time? It's eight o'clock. Yeah. We wrap up at nine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll go. We'll go through quickly. I want to be able to at least show the demo, and it's going to be a little tricky juggling these screens to go back and forth because I, um, I want to create a Selenium grid, so I'm going to talk a little bit about all these pieces. But in the end, I want to create a Selenium grid in Docker. And you can see how quick it takes to spin it up. Now, it, it took about seven to 15 minutes to to create the images. But once the images are created, um, then it, it was it was it will be really easy to spin up the containers. Can I start? Yeah. Okay. So second half, Docker. Oh, we still have a fine question there. It's fine. You want? You want me to wait? No, you want to continue? Okay. So we're going to talk about Docker. What is Docker? Does anybody know what Docker is? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Good. Eight. Docker allows you to package an application with all of its dependencies into a standardized unit for software development. Now, how is this different from a virtual machine? The virtual machine abstracts at the hardware layer. That means it has to, you have to have software that actually makes, emulates what the hardware is doing. The underlying hardware that the BIOS then connects to, right? So you got your infrastructure, you've got your host operating system, a hypervisor, you have guest operating systems on each virtual machine, you have bins and libraries, and then finally your app. That's a dependency tree of everything that needs to be there in order for that app to work. But a container, Docker uses, leverages this feature within Linux that's in the Linux kernel that allows you to you have an infrastructure, you have an operating system, you create a Docker engine, and then that's it. You've got your bins, 
your lives, and your your app. You don't need all this additional guest operating system with the uh, with the hardware emulation of the hypervisor. Although that you could say that that's the Docker engine, but it's much less resource intensive. But you limit it to the hardware you're running your OS on. It needs to be a Linux because it abstracts the kernel layer and it's a feature of Linux. So with VM, you can run Windows on Linux. You can, you can. run theoretically a Mac on it. Right. Not, not that easy, but. Right. <laughs> so uh, so this, this is, is this is all a Linux feature that you can leverage with Linux. So, so Dr. accused him for standardizing the guest OS part of it. It's not guest OS, right? Oh, there, there is no OS. Yeah. Yeah. So right. It's, 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 it's right. Yeah. It's just namespace surgery. Exactly. So Docker, it's available for the Mac and Windows running in a virtual box VM. On March 2016, there was a beta program announced <coughs> for Mac and Windows. And as of, this was, I originally wrote this in May, but as of August 15th, no VM to deal with on Mac and Windows. Well, here's the thing though. It's called Docker Windows on Windows. On, on prior to Docker Windows, prior to August 15th, it was called the Docker Toolbox. You you still want to go with the Docker Toolbox because there's a, there's a problem with installing the Docker Windows. Microsoft, so let me tell you, before I go to the Docker file, let me tell you a little bit about, so Docker on Windows is, essentially using VirtualBox with an Ubuntu image under the covers, and it uses Ming W to do the terminal session for your Docker engine, to be able to launch your Docker engine, to be able to, and, and it, the Ubuntu image that it uses is called boot to Docker ISO, boot the number two Docker ISO, and so, you're installing this Docker toolbox, which is fine, and then it creates this virtual environment and tries to make it as easy as possible to launch. The first time you run it, it actually has to boot up this virtual machine that is Ubuntu, just so you can run Docker inside of this Ubuntu, right? And, and that's okay. It's a, it's a virtual box, it's a virtual machine, and you can create other virtual machines because it's Oracle's virtual box. With Windows Docker, or Docker for Windows, it installs Hypervisor, Microsoft's product. And there's a caveat. When you install Hypervisor, VirtualBox will never work on that machine. Well, will not work on that machine. I haven't been able to get it to, uh, well, I've been able to uninstall to the point where I got VirtualBox working again, but I couldn't get Docker Toolbox to work again on that machine. So I ended up having to, on that particular machine, get VirtualBox running and then get um, a standard Ubuntu image on there and then install everything I needed to get Docker going and I was able to get it going on that machine. On other machines, I was able to use Docker Toolbox and it was fine but I'd stay away from uh, the Windows uh, Docker for now. Yes. Is it any easier with Windows 10 getting the embedded Ubuntu kernel? The embedded Ubuntu kernel. I have not tried that, <laughs> but that would be something interesting to uh, to see if, if, if you can make that work. But I would imagine that that also works with hypervisors. I'm guessing, I'm not sure how they implemented it because right. you get the Ubuntu kernel, you get the Ubuntu shell uh, and bash shell and all the uh, bash tools for free. Uh, within that, so. I tell you what, I have a challenge. Anybody who can find the answer to that question, the, you know, or if they've tried to play it around with uh, getting the uh, Ubuntu kernel in, in Windows 10, please post your experience, right? Oh, I mean, it would be cool. Uh, it would be cool to know. 
I'd be interested. Uh, any ideas why why Mark needs a virtual box? Mark is a uh, Mark is based on Unix. Right. Um, sure. Right. So I don't. So no VM to deal with with Mac and Windows. I don't know the Mac. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that question. I did that. Oh, so yeah. Were you able to do it in Docker remember. without having it? I don't remember if I had to do it as a virtual box. Yes, I did. You did yeah, have to yeah, do it as a virtual box? Yeah, but it Because it Mac, Apple. Unix is really like it's BSD, 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 yeah, it's BSD yeah, right? It's not the same and I don't know if BSD has the same kernel uh, feature for enabling containers that Linux does. I don't know. Okay, maybe it's just a little And that different. could be the reason. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be something else to investigate. So this is a Docker file. Um, are, is anyone familiar with Vagrant? Yeah, so Vagrant is a provisioning. So, um, it allows you to create uh, images, uh, virtual machine images, and um, you specify the uh, dependencies, what files need to be where, and you, you put that all inside the file. And the Docker file is very similar to the Vagrant file. Um, so this is saying from Ubuntu. So it's going to create an image that inherits from using Ubuntu as a bit, its base. All right. Um, this is just a, a environment variable called version, and it's set to 2.53.0. Uh, run app get update. It stalls. If you're familiar with Ubuntu, it stalls packages. Um, here's Java. I'm getting it from web update team. Um, and uh, license select true, dev conf, just some other things to set. And uh, this is a, another, some more of the same additional. Uh, Packages to install. Docker Compose. So, Docker, you can spin up. Uh, I should probably give you a little demo of Docker and Docker Compose. Docker Compose is a multi container Docker, uh, it allows for multi container Docker applications. So, you can create multiple Docker, image, uh, Docker images and Docker containers. And you can configure it with the Docker Compose YAML file. You familiar with the YAML file? OK. And here's a sample. There's a version 1 and a version 2. I recommend using the version 2 with some additional features. If you're starting out with Docker, um, just go right to the version 2 documentation and just specify version 2 at the top line of your, of your Docker Compose YAML file. In this particular case, and this is what I have up on uh, GitHub. Uh, create services, a hub. So we're going to create a Selenium grid hub. Uh, we're going to set the ports. And there's two numbers here. One is your um, the port of the actual container itself, the inside container. And then the outside is the port of sort of the host OS, right? What you're dealing with, you're running Docker inside it, right? And then in the case of a virtual machine, you want to expose that port to your actual desktop if you want it. And then you need to open ports in your, in your firewall in order to be able to have that service. So there runs the entire line. To have that little service inside Docker be exposed to anyone on the net be able to access your, your you know, in your local network to access your uh, Selenium grid. So here we're creating a hub, and here we're creating a Firefox node. So in Docker Compose, you define your application in the Docker file, what it looks like. You define your services in the Docker Compose YAML. And you start your entire application with all the different services by saying docker dash compose up with the YAML file in the same directory you're running that command. And it'll go through that. It's a it's magic. <laughs> it'll just start it up 
and start up all the containers that you that um, it's configured for in the Docker Compose YAML. The alternative is to manually start and build each each thing, build and start each thing. Selenium Grid. What is a Selenium Grid? So here's a picture I got from end-to-end -end automation history at eBay. In the beginning, it was the home-baked solution. Then you had, we evolved into something a little bit more called Selenium IDE. And then we had Selenium RC, remote control. And then oh, we were able to walk a little bit more upright and we had Selenium 2. And now we have Selenium Grid. We're able to walk upright. I know it can't be, but. <laughs> so what is a Selenium Grid? A grid is basic. What's that? <laughs> what is a Selenium Grid? Is a grid is basically a hub connected to any number of nodes. That's it. And you just communicate your test to the hub, and the hub takes care of which node is available for it. You give it desired capabilities, is what it's called. And you specify, I want Firefox on Linux. Or I just want Firefox, I don't care what machine. You, know, you can be as specific or as generic as you want to be. And it will, the hub will take care of seeing what's out there, assigning one of the nodes, take care of communications between the two of them. And if the node happens to go down, it'll automatically uh, wait a timeout interval and restart the node so it's back up and be operational. So if it locks up for some reason, uh, the hub takes care of all that. So you create a bunch of nodes, and now you can run tests in parallel. You can have multiple people accessing your grid, right? The client, and so a Selenium grid simplifies testing. A client always connects to one known endpoint, the hub. The hub takes care of browser allocation. The nodes can be added dynamically, and the hub handles bad nodes. Resiliency. The hub can send heartbeat requests to the node to tell if it's gone down. If it doesn't respond to the heartbeat, hey, <laughs> I'm going to reset you. The hub can gracefully kill idle sessions, can kill sessions that take too long to create. Putting it all together, Jeb to Grid. We can write tests that connect to Jeb. We're going to have Jeb, Spock, and Groovy. They're going to connect to the hub. And that hub is going to connect to Linux Firefox on Linux. And if I had a Windows system, I could run the standalone server and tell it I'm a Firefox node and have it register itself with the hub so I can have Docker with Firefox nodes running in Linux. And then on my Windows machine, even though it's the same machine, I can have Firefox no and then it will open up Firefox in my Windows machine and I'll actually see it. On the Docker nodes, you won't see it. But you'll get results, you'll get reports, and you'll get screenshots. That's the beauty of, of Jeb. It'll automatically create screenshots. So let's get a little demo going. How are we doing? Good. So this is where I should have Muzak playing. All right. Tell you what, let's go with this. We're going to run this first. We're going to switch to that. Come on. Stop. Start. And okay. Let me uh, start over here. Docker, important command. It, it, let's say you don't know what the commands are. Just say Docker. If 
it will give you, let me maximize this. It will give you all the parameters and, and commands there. And there's a help. You can get more detail on individual commands, uh, but it's pretty rich. You can get logs from Docker containers. You can uh, connect to, that, to Docker containers. Um, for debug, uh, there are two ways of debugging a container. If it doesn't start, you can, um, if a container is running, you can just exec a, a bash shell and connect to it and then start, and you can set what user you want to be when you connect to it. So if, if you want to be root, you can, you can, uh, and then look around and see if all the pieces are where you want it to be or execute things or install things. But understand the Docker container, the Docker container is a running instance of the image. So images are, you can think of like a snapshot in a virtual machine. Um, but a Docker container, even though a container is just like the image, you can have multiple of them. They'll even, and let's say they're, they're 500 megabytes each, you know, container because it's referenced from the image. It actually uses very little additional memory. And that's because only the differences are what you see from one, from one container to the other. Uh, differences between the container and the image. So if you were to install anything into a running container, and you happen to blow away that container and you built a new one, it would be built from the image and you everything you had in that container would be gone. Unless you took that container and committed it to an image and then you could go into that image, uh, into the creating a container from that image and connect to it and, and use it. Sure. What's happening in terms of persistence of data on those containers? So there, um, I, I've set up a Jenkins um, uh, container, right? And what I'll do is I'll create a share of the volume. So I'll have the Jenkins home shared with my desktop. And then this way I can go in and look look at the actual, because otherwise it would be gone. It would be, it would take whatever's in the image and, and you would lose it. So it depends on how you have it configured. So what I do is by sharing that, I can then go, it's good for debugging. I can go in, I can see it. I can take that whole volume and I, uh, that whole directory structure and I can save it and back it up. And there's like, after all the plugins and the projects and everything you can saw, it could be three gig, four gig, five gig worth of storage that you need to back up. But then when I need to rebuild it, all I have to do is restore that, that Jenkins home um, after I, created a brand new image uh, and created a brand new container and started running it uh, with that new Jenkins home and boom, I'm, up, I'm in business and everything's back to the way it was originally. So you just have to persist it outside? You have to persist it out, outside, right. And you can do that a couple of ways. That's only one way of doing it. Another way is Docker has commands that allow you to take that volume. So let's say you didn't share it. You can take that volume as long as you, um, you know, it's still there. You you take it and you can export it, and then you could import it from, you know, some other place and, and bring the data in. Well, if you need to uh, persist in database, you can actually connect to the database if you install it running somewhere else. It'd be some, running someplace else, right? How much resources usually a Selenium hub and take? How much what? How much resource? A hub and we'll take um a selenium hub in the node we'll we'll take a look at that so here let's look at what docker images i have on this machine so i've already built these um i've got an ubuntu latest i've got a base what i did was i created a docker file for the base <laughs> image um and I put the common things between the Firefox nodes and the hub all in that base so that the hub inherits from the base. If you go out to Selenium headquarters, they'll go 
another level deeper. They'll create a node base and a hub base, I believe. It's like there's this other level of abstraction. I didn't feel that was necessary. Um, just going to this level of abstraction works fine for me. Because the more levels and dependencies that you create, when to first create that image, it takes longer and longer because you have to build out from the bottom and go all the way up the top. So if you have a problem somewhere all the way in the bottom, you have to rebuild everything to get up to the top. But once everything is built, like it is here, so I spent you know about 15 minutes um, building it, and uh, the base, the hub, and the Firefox node. And I, I can just give you the command. So let's see the, in fact, I'll go through the motions. Uh, can you read this okay? Yeah. Is, is that all right? Okay. Um, projects. M2 grid. And I got this right from my GitHub, and I've updated it. So if I do a Git status. Oh, yeah, maybe I've modified something in the presentation, but it's right from there. So there's uh, from the GitHub, I've got code examples in the code example section. I've got Selenium Grid um, and the slides right from the on GitHub. So CD to Selenium Grid in this directory. Oh, I don't have tree installed. Well, let's try it. sudo apt install tree. I'd rebuilt my system with Ubuntu. So you said images are inheriting. Is it the uh, inheriting in terms of uh, how you create them? Or it actually has a, a relationship still embedded in the image? So this two gigabyte which you have for Firefox node, it's on top of 1800 megabytes, which is the basis, or it's include the base image? So it's um, for the Docker, the parts that are inherited, uh, it includes the base inside of it. So when you create it, it's inherited. So right. Then it's it, it's it essentially namespaces that get moved around. So itself, it, it's like it's going to be using those pieces. So it, it's an API, and it and it when you you've set up the relationships, those pieces are are in there. They're not duplicated. They're they're in there. They're in the image, and then the image is utilized within the containers. And if the images are inherited from other images, only the differences of what makes that image unique is really the extra resources that it takes. So if I storage. take your uh, two gigabyte file with a Firefox node mm -hmm. and move it to another machine, it won't work. Um, well, you need to have all the... You break the dependencies. All the, yes, you break the dependencies, right, 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 right. right. So you need all the pieces in order to make it work. Okay. You could build out a system from scratch. You could create something that has everything in it. And yes, it would be the full two gigabyte, but you could create an image that does that. So here's here's the directory structure. So just to go over it a little bit, there's the base has a Docker file. Um, Chrome, this is experimental. This doesn't work yet. So it's like, don't try it, or you could try it um, uh, if you want to live dangerously and waste a lot of time. Um, it's Chrome needs special handling, so uh, you got to bring the Chrome driver down. There's a bunch of other stuff. So what I'm going to show you is just the Firefox node. We have Chrome working at work. We actually leveraged it from the Selenium grid, uh, Selenium headquarters um, on GitHub and uh, used that portion of it and ported it over to what I've got. Um, var log, uh, so the Firefox node consists of two pieces. Um, we've got a Docker file and a Selenium node register. This is just a script that will run the actual, and I'll, I'll show it to you, and the hub. We've got a Docker file and the Selenium hub start, and we got some logs. I told it to share with this 
folder and so it, it actually put it put logs in there uh, locally so and I was also experimenting a little bit with Windows um, so let's start with base and I'll show you the docker file and what that looks like version 2531 is the version for um, selenium that we're using and we can see this is the variable and then over here where it's actually getting from Google um, the version folders to call 2.53 without the minor and um, we're getting a Selenium server standalone with that particular version jar. And we're doing a wget on it, and we're putting it into the slash var directory within that, within that image. And the command for that would be this. I'm not going to actually run it, but I'll show you. It would be docker uh, build dash t. We have to give it a tag. And, and this is important because I use the naming convention for all the dependencies of all the Docker files. So it, it's going to get the right one based on this name. So uh, selenium grid slash base colon 2.5, 3.5. Okay. And then uh, I would say dot because you have to give it what Docker file it's going to be using. And I'm saying dot for the Docker file that's in that current directory. That's how I'd actually build it. And then it actually doesn't take very long to build from there. But um, I had a feeling there might be a problem with the network. So I tried to be prepared and have everything all set up just in case that was the. the um, the hub, do the hub next. And the Docker file, very similar. I'll just show it real quick. Much smaller. <laughs> um, so from Selenium, so there's that naming convention I was telling you about. If that's not there, it's not going to grab it, right? So you got to name it correctly when you first build it. So Selenium grid base. Um, and then, uh, and I'm playing around with the, the new Selenium that's 3.0.0, but it requires completely different drivers. So rather not go there right now. <laughs> it really is a problem. I tried playing around with it. I couldn't get the thing to work. I ended up, because I was running into problems with Selenium. Selenium has a, an issue with communicating what ver they say Compatibility is important to them, but they don't, that's all they say in on their page. But they won't give you a map of which versions of Selenium work with, with and, and all these companies, and I'm talking to other people, and they're telling me they're creating their own map. So you got all these pools of information that's all the way around. And this, what versions I'm using, I got from a manager of Selenium headquarters that has a blog and he posted that information on there. And it's like, why doesn't he just post it onto the Selenium headquarters site? I don't understand. So that's, um, it's just something we live with, with open source. It's like, they seem to do what they, what they want. And, and I've even posted, comments out there it's like why don't you do this it wouldn't it be easier i mean it's like why are we having to figure this out uh, so or even better give us the test results of what versions you're actually work testing with and what you've actually tested with each release that comes out wouldn't that be cool right isn't that what professional software actually does that's what we did at ibm with release um uh, the release notes that came out with our software, we put that in, you know, this is... It's also will prove that they actually eat their own dog. dog exactly. Dog. It would. It would <laughs> prove it. So um, I'm setting the... So this is a script, and we're going to look at the script next, and it's adding it. In other words, it's taking it from the current directory, 
and it's sending it to the slash var slash selenium dot hub dot start on the doc on the Docker image that it's creating, and uh, we're setting it to be executable. And this is uh, we're going to then run it. We're doing a command using Bash to run that script as the very end of the Docker file for creating the Docker Hub. And now we look at that file, Selenium Hub start, and so we start the Selenium Grid Hub. I set some variables: two five three one Hub port. I use four four three three. Uh, Selenium uses 4444. There's a reason. I, it turns out that there's sometimes there's a conflict with 4444 for certain conditions. I ran into a problem, and so since then I changed it to 4433. I haven't had the problem since. So that I, you can use whatever port you want. Um, just make sure you're consistent amongst all the Docker files and um, and the and the scripts. So here we're we're echoing. So we're going out and we're sent. We're we've got a log dir. We check and create logs in the log directory, and this is the command. We're running Java. Is that? I, I'm just saying that the most time it takes for your installation rather than running the Selenium infrastructure. For installation is that's yeah, the most time. Most You're time. absolutely right. So it takes time to create it the first time around, but I'll show you what happens once it's create once the index is created. So um, it helps to have something like GitHub to be able to download something to start with, and then you can you know just get that working, get familiar with it, and then build it and change it because then you don't have to be you know uh, inventing the wheel from scratch. Um, so Java jar, this slash at the end, if, if you don't know in bash is, uh, extends the line. So we've got additional options here. So we're just running this jar, which is 2.53.1 dot jar. And we're going to say, we're passing to the jar that we're going to set the role as hub. We're going to set the port as this port four four three three. We're going to set the browser timeout to 300 seconds is what I'm about 90% sure it might. There's, there are some conflicts and they, they changed its meaning over, over time. Uh, timeout is 300 seconds and the log file is the, the log path and we set the path. So, if this doesn't execute, sometimes you know, if there's a problem with that, then one thing to do is to get into the and I don't have it up there, but I'll include the debugging capability so that you can see if it, if a Docker container doesn't work, how do you find out if a Docker container doesn't work? And I'll include that information there because that was something that I had to search for and it took me a lot, uh, some time to find this particular set of instructions that, that really helped me. And it's just two lines when the Docker container won't start. And, and you do those two lines, you, you commit it to an image, and then you run another container from that image using bash with these two lines. And now you're in that container, and you could run that command that would be in there and see what the error result is that's coming back so you can see what, what's happening. Another way is also you can look at if there's a Docker file, you go Docker log, you can just say Docker log and the container number and it will tell you what's in the log if there's a log. Um, so Docker images, we're back to this. And I'm going to we have we have a base. We don't need to build it. I showed you the command for the base. We have the images for the hub and the Firefox nodes. Um, so I'm going to run Docker Compose. Oh, let's look at the YAML. Uh, we, you saw the YAML file. I don't need this to show you again. Let's do a Docker Compose up dash D. I'm in the Selenium grid. 
directory that directory has the uh, where is it do, 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 tree the docker compose yaml file all right it's in there right off right in this directory dash d is detach we're done if I do a docker ps docker ps gives you what containers are running if the containers were down I wouldn't see them docker and and you can see the status here over in the right side status up five seconds up six seconds if I say docker ps dash a you can see all containers including those that aren't running I don't have any other containers I deleted them all so but that's um, so it created one hub and one Firefox node let's verify that let's go to I'll need to switch again this is where I play music can somebody sing I guess not. <laughs> oh, so la mio. All right, come on. When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie. I think that's the one I want. The smiley face. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Let's go. That's that's the get Jeb to grid. Uh, oh, you know what? It's not. I don't have that tab anymore. I used to. Oh, you know what? I did. Let's do it here. Jeb to grid. No, I didn't. Okay. All right. What did I say it was? I said it was HTTP. Come on. I'll do this. Thing. HTTP. Uh, let's do a local host colon four four three three. Will that work? Yeah. All right. So you can go right to the hub, but it, there's actually if you click on console. And this is the Selenium Grid hub, and it's making a liar. I mean, the um, the Firefox node is not up. It hasn't registered. So this is the hub, and we would see the Firefox node here, but it's not there. So I'm going to save this. And get back to it. Let's debug this because we've got. We're not screencasting the. Uh, are, we're screencasting this, right? No, or no, no we didn't. Browser, oh, we went back to yeah. the. Right. <laughs> All right. Let me screencast. Now, there is something I want to tell you. Um, does, it, does everybody? And then, okay, we should be soon. Um, Docker PS, it says it's up, so there's some sort of problem. It's been up four minutes, and we don't have it. Is it at the ports 5555? No. So those are additional ports that it needs. 
so Docker, so let's look at the so Firefox node. CD Firefox. I'm just going to look at the configuration quick. Um, Docker file and 253.45.3.0. That's okay. Everything looks good. And then it selenium.node.register is the file that it runs. Um, selenium node register. And we see it's 192.168.1.4.4433. Although is that your current IP address? Is that the current IP address? That's a good question. It may Whatever. not. It may not be. It's it's uh yeah it's well it's internal network so but it's probably not that we need to I would need to so that's why it's not working. So you need to know what network what your uh, what my current IP address is. Yeah. Why don't you go with localhost? Why and I could go with localhost, but what would I have to do? I have to rebuild the image, rebuild the Firefox image because okay. this so is now that. in the image and it's not there, right? <laughs> it's down to the right. So yeah. I mean, there's there's other ways of doing this, uh, and I'm going to go with the quick and dirty <laughs> rather than trying to rebuild off of a possible. I mean, the network's been pretty good with this um, phone. Um, we're going to do a little debugging here. So I'm going to say, so we've got the nodes now here, container, and the Firefox node. I'm going to connect to the running Firefox node. So it's running. It's trying to connect. I should probably see something in the log. So let's do Docker log and give it the Firefox node. I could give it the entire node ID, but you don't have to. What's cool is you only have to give it enough numbers to, or letters to uh, characters to make it unique. So of the list, all you have to do, I could just give it one eight. Oh, come on. I say log one eight. Oh. Logs. It's not log, it's logs. Start node from PID1. That's all we see. Let's look at the hub. Docker logs. And the hub is E4. And so this is the end of the log. And it says it's available, right? So Let's connect docker exec dash it um, the no the container ID one eight space bash I'm in and I'm in this root I'm now in. I'm now in this container in the Firefox node, and I'm looking at it, and I see the commands and the processes that are running. And yeah, look at that. We've got that one that's the Java, and it's running. But what we really want is java-jar slash var. Lenny slash let's copy and paste. I'm such a slow typer. Let's go to here. Let's try the local host. Colon 4433 slash grid slash. Oh, come on, give us the full. Uh, 
I can't copy link address. Yeah, let me do that. And then paste. Oh, is that it? I guess that was it. Let's try. Uh, no, I thought there was one more. Your IP address is still wrong, but right, right. Um, if you go to script, you. If I go to the script, exactly. So. That script is in var, and there it is. Bim selenium. Oops. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, grid slash register, and there's more. There's much more. Why don't you just fix the IP address? I could. Temporarily. And then temporarily. And I'll fix it up here. And then I'll just run the script. Oh, will this work? It's worth a try. Oh, it failed to start. Is that because I've already... So, the, notice that this is a little different. The hub only had the Java standalone jar. Well, why is the, the node is different? We've got this other thing going on before it. We've got xvfb-run. What is that? That's a frame buffer. It's it it it's there's no desktop. You notice there's hardly anything running in this in this Docker container. This isn't a normal Linux system, or is it? Right? All the dependencies are there. Everything is there that you need to run a Linux system. You could run a whole desktop on in Docker if you wanted to. But all we need for Firefox is a frame buffer. Something for Firefox to be able to run inside of and have memory and space that it can then do its thing and think it's running in a desktop, all right? That's what this XVFB run does. And so we're running the Java jar inside of this XVFB as an option to it. Um, Aren't you already claiming that? Yes, that's what I think is happening. So we've got a uh, started node error, the XVFB failed to start. My guess is it's because we're, we're already using that display port and, it, and we've got a, we've got a conflict. So I should be able to, let me see, I might end up killing myself here, but let, let, let's try this. I'm going to kill the Java the actually the XVFB, so I'm going to do kill 18, uh, minus 9, 18, and 25. Although 25 should also, hey, I'm out. Yep. So I have to commit. Yes. Uh, let's see if this would work. Docker. They're in the container, but they're not in the image. Is the file system shared with the real file system? Start, no. So I'm going to go Docker start. The node one eight. And the file so file you just changed does not change. No. So you can't start it. Hey, it started. Uh, Docker. 
Uh, we want Docker uh, exec dash it. Let's go into it. One eight is the container ID. Uh, oh, bash. Forgot to give it. Oh, yeah. Give it bash. CD the slash bar. And uh, let's do a PS dash EF. It did it. It picked it up. So all I did was a Docker start and gave it, and it was able to restart it. And there's no errors because we had already we had killed the previous frame buffer. So now it's it should work. Hey, that would be cool. I'm gonna buy a lottery ticket if this works. Mm -hmm. Let's share. Come on. We want to share this. We want to go to the grid console. We want to refresh this. Did it register? Come on. It did not register with the grid console. So we need the IP address um, of what we're dealing with. Although we can go to the grid console here, it doesn't, it's not enough. We need to give it the IP address. We could try this again. The only local host in there is the local host of the container that has already been. Right. Yeah, that's only one. Right, which wouldn't be where the hub is. That's correct. And that's probably that's probably what's happening. I wanted to show you Jeb, um, the and this actually running, but it's going to fail. Um, I could go ahead and run this. I don't want to. We've got it's 2056. What do you guys want me to do? You want me to try and run this and then look at the Jeb report and see the Jeb report and we'll see the failure? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what do you running? You might have you'll have to share the screen because right now you're just right. on uh what cam? Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is, um, I like IntelliJ. This is a community edition, works well with Groovy. Uh, there are some little quirks I'm still trying to get used to with uh, um, seeing the, uh, well, in, in this case, it, there's no problem. But as your project gets more complicated, um, you want to make sure you have your sources set right, which are sources and which are tests um, in your project structure. So uh, this is a sample. This is the, the jeb.groovy file. This is a base URL. So if you don't have a URL in your spec, it's going to assume this base URL. If you have a URL and it's an, a relative URL, it's going to be relative from this base. If it's a, you can have a full absolute URL if that's what you want in a spec, as and the base if you need to, and it'll know the difference. Um, this is the Gradle config file, and what we're going to do is we're going to have a, a jebish.org spec. This is very simple. It's going to go to the jebish.org web page. Um, it, it's going to uh, interact. It's going to move to an element. Now, this is so this is a module that was created that's sort of a helper that's uh, it's giving extra functions here because it, it's going to hover over the manuals menu. It's going to toggle it. It's going to click. Uh, then we do a manuals menu links text ends with current. Uh, we click on that. And then we should end up at the book of Jeb page, uh, the man actual manual. So 
uh, running this. There's a couple of ways to run this. Uh, and there's a more than one way. So in Gradle, there's the ability to have, you can run just one thing. There's actually two things here. There's a spec, and there's also a, another way of doing it as a JUnit um, test. So you can have a, a Spock spec or a JUnit. And uh, I tell you, I love Spock. I, I've been going with even writing my unit tests in Spock. Um, but they give the example, and this is off GitHub and the Jeb example Gradle, um, and and it's in it's in the source. I, I copied it, brought it into the source, made some changes to it to make it work against the same grid, and uh, it's also in my my GitHub page. Um, the task is Firefox test, and I just want to run this one spec. If I didn't put this, it would run Firefox test and run all the tests that are in this folder. So I'm going to say, OK. I'm going to say, run it. It's going to build. It's configuring. It pulls down any dependencies if it needs to. It's already done that, so it shouldn't take that long. Showing me uh, the Firefox test. It's now grown, going into the Gradle test executor. And you can set how many executors you want if you want to do this in parallel. Um, and you had a, a bunch of tests that you were running. Jebish org spec can get to the current book of Jeb. It's trying to run it. And it's saying how long these things are running for on the right. This is kind of cool. This is additional information that's in IntelliJ. Um, if you were doing this from the command line, that's you know all this stuff here that I showed you that would be right from the command line. You just say um, you could either run it from Gradle W. Um, Gradle W is whatever. It will automatically get the. It's a script that automatically gets the latest, ver the current version of Gradle for that project that you built. When you set Gradle W, um, you can set, include it in your um, in, in your project, and it will bring down that that Gradle version, and then use that to run it. So you don't actually have to install Gradle, which is great for Jenkins because you're setting Jenkins and you want to set Jenkins up to where you, you don't need to install a certain version of Gradle and you can have different projects use different versions of Gradle and it's associated with that project. It'll automatically go out, get what it needs, and then run the, the test inside. Um, this is still running, so just showing you this. So it would just be a Gradle uh, or a Gradle W. If you had Gradle install, you just say Gradle space Firefox test, which is the task. And if you wanted to run just one, you do dash dash test Jebish org. And it would show you something like this. Uh, the one next oh, to it. did you I hit the wrong? Yeah. I just reset it. God, oh, dang it. Do I need to stop this and start it again? Uh, well, you can, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Build failed. So this is what you would see on the command line. There's your, your command, task, tests, Jebish org spec. You'd see all this. You'd see additional information as um, XML. But this is cool. Let me see if I have the test results. So this is a, a, when it's working. Yeah, you're not, you're not, uh, I know. Testing. I'm not sharing. <laughs> I need to share more. There we go. Sharing's good. Yes. 
Uh, I want this one. Yep. Okay, let's go to, this is what it looks like when the test pass passes. And you can have a whole list of things here. Um, typically, as uh, best practices, I would name the feature methods with an O1 space and the name of the feature, O2 space and the name of the feature, O3 space and the name of the feature. The reason for that is because of this report. In the report, you'll see, and then you go into the package and you go into the Jebashore spec, and in this case, there's only one feature method. Well, if you had 10 feature methods, let's say in here, the report would sort it alphabetically. And that might not be the order in which you have things. Maybe you have your tests set so that they're, they're dependent on one another and that sequence is important. And you can set stepwise, at stepwise annotation, and it will sequence through and you can be assured that it's gonna go one right after the other. Um, you can also ignore uh, all and then that one that one feature method would be the only feature method let's say you're building it out but you know you want everything else you don't want everything else to run you just want this one so there's different trains of thought on using right I mean you could you could create make it so that your feature methods are and this is the way unit tests would be a complete independent thing that runs independent of everything else Right, as long as the setup is right, as long as the cleanup, right, it, so it could be independent. But then there's the other train of thought. If you're doing like an end to end test, then you'd want your tests to be dependent upon one another. And it turns out that you get a lot of bang for the buck when you do that. So you want you want this thing to happen. You want to check to see if it if it's valid. You want this thing to happen. Check to see if it's valid. And this thing, and this thing, and this thing. But you, so they're each dependent upon the state of the system prior to, to it running, right? And so, so each thing becomes a test, right? And that's important for integration tests or end-to-end -to -end tests to get the complete workflow. Um, so if you want your, your report to reflect that, then have zero, 01 space, zero, 02, or have some numbering mechanism to where it's going to be in the order that you specified, not the alphabetical order. All right, just a little tip. Um, okay, if I refresh this, will it have failed already? No, is it still running? Still timing out? Might be. Check on it. Oh, the time out. Wasn't it 300 seconds? Five minutes? Yeah. No, that was uh, some tanks. Yeah. yeah. So, what we want is this. But I need to, yeah, see the thing's still running. It's run for four minutes. So, evidently, it's going to, it's going to time out, but it's going to take much longer. Than I expected. Um, well, while this is still percolating, let me go back to, and I'll, I'll share it. I'll need to bring up this. Oh, you know what? I mean, a completely different, it hopped. To a different works, a uh, different space here. And this Google Hangout. I just want to show you the directory structure of the reporting. Um, actually, you know what? I can do this from inside IntelliJ. If 
I can get back to IntelliJ. up all right this is still running but we can look at the report it may have cleared it out so the gradle will create this build folder the build folder will have the classes and the reports and um, we'll have the resources uh, it's essentially the project built with the, you know the classes and all dependencies. So we've got the Firefox test, we've got your Jeb Orgish spec, we have tests, and there's an index.html. This is the actual report. That's the index.html. But these two directories in the Jeb folder, so index.html is in tests, but these two are important. If you go into spec. And make a liar. At. Okay, it cleared it out. Inside spec would be the PNG and the HTML of each of for one for each one set for each feature method that was executed. So it automatically and and you can easily create by getting the browser um, object and do dot report and you can create a report at any given time you know within if you want to get a copy of the html of the page and the uh p the a copy of what the page looks like and that's what i wanted to show you on it it is done so oh in this case there's not going to be of course there's not going to be any oh you know what here's a sample i can show you because this was a previous test that i ran and we didn't tell it to run the unit test, right? So here's a, here's a sample PNG file. I double clicked. Look, can I? Out of memory. Really? Eight gigs of memory, and that was not. Yeah, but it good enough. IntelliJ wasn't set to have enough memory. Oh yeah. Okay. So. In something yeah. else, right click on it. Showing files. Uh, uh, where is it? Copy new oh, down, 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 down. Right there, up, up, up to. If I show in file okay. manager, yeah, there we go. And then from there, you have to show it. right, oh. look how little it, it is. We're going to say open with Firefox web browser. It's a PNG file. Jeez, what the hell is that? I'll tell you what it is. This is the Jebish Org manual. Now it'll take you a little bit to. <laughs> you're, you're not. You're not uh, sharing that, though. Right. <laughs> I need to share. Thank you for being the share police. <laughs> <laughs> do we really yeah. want to share that? Oh, of course. <laughs> right. Do we really want to share it? <laughs> the entire manual. All right. Here. Let's. <laughs> There we go. We're screen sharing. We're going to here, and here's a little manual for you. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, I just tried to make it bigger, one. and it's busy thinking about it. Uh oh. So anyway, this is Jeb. This is the reporting. This is what all this talk has been about. Uh, I hope this has been useful to you. Um, I'm Ralph Navarro. Uh, Q and A questions? Any quick questions or? So does it create this uh, snapshots automatically? You said it automatically creates the snapshots. One, uh, the uh, an image of the page and the actual HTML of that page. Now, if you open the HTML in the browser, it may not work because credentials aren't there. Or, you know, I mean, if you're using enterprise software. And, but what if the page is dynamic? So uh, at which moment it will take the, the It takes it at the end of the so um it takes it at the if it's if it's good, it takes it at the end of the feature method. If it's bad, it takes it at the failure. So when it fails, you'll get an image of what the screen looked like when it failed. 
and that has been very useful. So, do you and, use that? Yes. Yeah. And you said that you can force it to, to make more uh, snapshots. Yes, you can. You can tell it within the code to you know I want a snapshot at this time just because I want one, right, or for some other reason. Right? So Ralph, is is this now? If I'm a little confused. A feature of Jab, or is it's it a feature, feature of actually? Selenium? I think it's a feature of Spock and the Gradle mechanism. The um, so in running the test. Um, but I think it's Spock that actually does this. But it's in, so it's actually the Jeb browser that you can initiate and tell it to run the report. But I, this mechanism is there even if you're just running Spock tests. So you can tell it to run a report. And it, let's say you just want to run Spock and you're not using Jeb, you're just using Spock specifications. So you can still generate. Um, Oh, no, 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 you wouldn't. Yeah, Wait a minute, but I did, oh, but I was using the Jeb, uh, and, and I and I still, right, I was still using the Jeb Spock, you're right. Brain fart there, sorry. Uh, so, uh, Jeb, as I understand, build on top of the Spark, so the Spark yes. creating the report. Yeah. Right, it's, it's the overall but, report HTML. right, the overall the report, report right. is, is Spock. The overall report is Spock because that that's there, but the but the screen, screen capture is Jeb. Right. But, uh, how about, so it's part right. How about cloud? Do people is there any kind of Selenium grid that runs on the cloud? So yeah. Oh. Interesting question. Hi, I'm David. I, I know Ralph from a previous job, but I'm not a client. Meeting. Right, I was. I, uh, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I had told him about it when uh, four years ago. Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah, but I didn't remember it too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, I used to do some testing at Care, which is like down the street from you all, and they used Jeb to do the Spock to do testing. And we, one of the problems is we only had Windows machines. We didn't have anything else. We wanted to know what our Mac customers were complaining about, so you can use. The two places we use were Sauce Labs and Browser Stack, and they will both take the um, the output of the Selenium. Uh, what's it called? Web. Right. Web driver. Thank you. Yeah. And you just send the web driver over the internet to them, and they will use that to drive whatever combination of browser, uh, operating system version, and uh, whatever else they have to, to capture all this. Uh, there's a, a free to test and uh, pay to play. So really, cloud is not required because these browsers run on the client's machines rather than on server. Yeah. So that's why. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very nice service. They also will let you run it on mobile uh, browsers and things like that. Features. Cloud becomes important when you want to actually run it on different devices. Right. Yeah, but I mean cloud in terms of like servers, maybe usually it's the same cloud, but in this case, like distributed kind of yeah, system. It's more distributed. Now I, I need to show you one last thing. Docker. We have these two, and we know the Firefox isn't working. It's not connecting to the hub. It doesn't know how to talk to it. Uh, it's not. It's going to the wrong place. But um, it is up and running. Um, so I, I want to show you. So this is, you know, we did a Docker compose space up dash d, and d, it detached. If if we didn't use the dash d, all the log information would go to the screen. And then if you do a control C, you exit out and it kills the session, right? So you just have to say Docker space start and give it the, the container and it would start back up. But um, uh, here's a neat feature, another neat feature of Docker compose scale Firefox equals five. Done. Docker PS. I just started five hundred. 
a total of five Firefox nodes. I told it to scale up to five, and those five Firefox nodes would have registered with the hub, and you would have seen all five nodes in the hub, and it would have shown you. So, and you saw how quick it was to start up and spin up five nodes. I, I can actually do eight on my system at work and without any problem. I'm what only using this, half of my resources. What happens in this case where, you know, different ports are configured into each image and they're all pointing the same port? So each doctor node is getting its own IP address. And so within the, within the Docker file, so let's look at that Firefox again. Um, we see Vim uh, Docker. I don't know if this answers your question. So is it kind of a dynamic so, side end of, of the ports? They're all separate machines. Yeah, which means there's the same port available for all of that. The configuration we're talking about is where the hub is connected. Right. And so the important part is that, and they'll get their own IP address, and it'll be like, um, actually, we can see what the what the IP address would be, Docker PS, right? Uh, Docker uh, exec-it. Um, uh, let's look at one of these, uh, 3F. Uh, bash, and we do an if config. Oh, gee, sudo apt. We have to install I am. Oh, is it in sudo? Uh, it's in S bin. Okay, so slash S bin. Oh, user S bin. S bin. IF config, no such file directories. So there's some package that we're missing to get IF config in order to see what the. But that would tell us what IP address uh, there is. There's another feature in Docker we can look at, but um, I've used this with mixed results. If you say Docker, there's a. Uh, not stats. Stat, stats would be like performance. You want to do use statistics. Um, uh, inspect low level information on the container. So, Docker PS, Docker inspect. Let's look at 3F. All right, well, let's pipe it to less. Less is always more. Uh, and I think there was an IP in here somewhere. Slash IP. Slash IP. Address 172.18.06, and the gateway is 18.01. So Docker takes care of networking. And remember in the, uh, so in the Docker file, for the ports where there was a port. In this case, there wasn't a port in the Firefox node, right? There was a port in the hub. In the hub, the, remember I showed you there were two, there was a colon separating the two. One was the port that is inside the Docker container. The other is the port that's um, within your, uh, on the host and if you're running in a virtual machine, then you'd have to deal with exposing that out to um, your actual network, your local network. So, but it takes care of handling the IP address. So what would happen if you provide uh, the, um, the process, not, not unique prefix of the Docker? Not a unique prefix. Oh, it, it will complain. Right. Let's say it wasn't unique enough. It will complain and say that there are two items there. You have to make it more unique. It, it will do that. I, I tried that. A static IP in Docker. For, for your, uh, you could configure it as such, but for your hub. it can handle it. Yeah, for, for, the, for the hub. Right. But 
I didn't do that because, you know, if you're in a different environment, a static IP is going to be dependent upon what subnet you're on. Uh, right. The, uh, virtual box creates, you can create your own server. Yes. So if it was inside a virtual box, yeah. in this case, I'm running on an Ubuntu right. machine. So, okay. right. Yeah. So then in virtual box, you can go to the network setting for that and then set your, your port forwarding for um, exposing it to the outside world. Or you can also create a host on the network, actually your own network. Oh, all well, within, virtual, inside uh, the virtual box. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. And then they can all communicate to each other. Yeah. And yeah. Multiple dockers, yeah. What's that? And run multiple dockers inside. Inside, inside yes. Inside that yeah. Yeah. So to let you know how I use this, I've got Jenkins in running in a Docker container with the Selenium grid, all each running, you know, where I have all these containers and I've got um, eight Firefox nodes running with the hub. It's all running on my machine. And I uh, opened up the ports so that um, other uh, uh, tests automation developers on my team can access my Selenium grid and my uh, 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 Jenkins, and they can and and this is also the the project developers. They can access and they can see tests that are running every three hours, all night. And so why, all day on the, why do you have to have that on your machine? Why not exactly. That? So so before I leave, my contract ends in, in, on October 31st. One of the things I'm working on is getting this onto Amazon, AWS. And uh, I'm training the existing development, uh, the existing automation development team. And uh, so I started off by getting them up to speed with this part with getting the Selenium grid, getting Jenkins up and running on their machines. So at least they understand all the pieces in play. And now I'm uh, going to be putting this up on AWS. AWS recently added a, like a Docker Compose type mechanism. So it's in ECS. So I, I'm going to be playing around with that and trying to get it up there and then leveraging that on AWS. So once. Once it gets up there, now it's in a livable place, and um, uh, and it's you know all the stuff is on source control, so we can easily recreate and you know rebuild the system from scratch if necessary. Yeah, having that local on your machine makes sense for your right. real work, right? But it doesn't make sense to expose those right. people. But it's it, it's exposed to other people so that they can utilize and see the reports they're running. So. In order to get productive, I built it out on my machine because that's the easiest and quickest way. That it turns out that there are other factors in play in order to get it up to AWS because we have a dev environment in AWS, and then we have an entire duplication of that environment for QA, which is but it's different for different data that's more closely tied with the customer, the production environment. Which is another copy of that entire environment in production. So Thank you. that's uh, you know, uh, and, and the the challenges there is that you know things like to get to QA, you have to go through uh, uh, a junk box, which is a, a desktop. You know, you have to do remote desktop to uh, no, I, Microsoft Box. I said no, that. absolutely, yeah. absolutely, to build that and just even to use that. For yourself right. on your local right. machine, obviously have it on local So machine. I was able to get tests up and running and get them usable and, and people could see the results of those tests against the against the product and be able to actually see the you know and and you know open bugs and uh, you know work on problems and add code and so while that effort is going on I'm continuing to work out the infrastructure to make it even more usable for for longevity, right? To get it, it really needs to sit up on AWS, and so it will in the dev environment. And then we're working out the details for the QA. Yeah, but uh, but the environment that you set up, it's only like one system, right? One kind of system. So do okay. 
Well, it's now on. It's it's actually now on one, two, three, four systems. But yeah, go ahead. But no, I mean that's the company that you work for. Mm -hmm. Do they have like real systems? All right, good. This, then I'll have all their for this. So they do have a on prem, as they call it, on premise, which is their local systems. But they're going towards everything being on the cloud, and cloud services and microservices and so. So there's no reason why this can't be up on the yeah. cloud. Well. Yeah, but you're testing clients. You're not testing servers. Right? You're testing clients. Oh, no, yeah, well, yeah. no, 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 no. So end-to-end -end tests, it's like, it's I, it's I, it's I, it's I... It does define the behavior with the client. Right. UI. Has to work with the server. Right, but the client works with the server. So I have Spock yeah, yeah. tests at the, which will do API calls directly to... Uh, it, it'll. I'll check the MySQL database for verification that data is in certain tables after you've done certain things on the on the UI. So I'll go into the back end testing to verify as part of a complete yeah, yeah, workflow. I understand, yeah, I understand about the back end, but, but I'm talking about Selenium runs basically the browser or talks to the browser right right but so otherwise the browser he's using the browser because a hammer and hit the server i mean well oh, so not from a performance standpoint no but just that's like yes yeah. so you're whacking it yeah. yeah. whack, that's all i mean no right. rather this you are testing the client which is a web application which is which is includes a uh, javascript <laughs> CSS, right. all of that. And accessing microservices under the covers. Which is interpreted by the browser. Right. So Selenium, this is what Selenium oh, yeah. does. It creates a browser. Yeah, but but from saying, a user standpoint, but what right? I'm saying that no, no, no. It's, if you really want more, like a complete test, you have, you have to have separate, separate each kind of operating system and that has each kind of browser. Like Yes, it's but in your environment, it's and like a very narrow. So, yeah, so that's my question. So, do they have also this all kind of like species, species that they also test, or just one kind that you do? So, the, one of the problems is that Selenium uh, web driver does not really work across all five browsers they claim to. They can work across all of them, but at different versions, and the level of it works with Android. It works. With I'm just talking about. I'm just talking about the, the clients for Windows. I'm and not even. Not even you just have to run it on that on that device, and and you just have to give it what hub it's going to connect with, and then that device becomes an extension of right. the grid. But this is Selenium limitation. But and right, it's a limitation of Selenium yeah. that it does not always work in the latest version of. Browsers. So right. while your customers yeah, may have the, you know, whatever is included in iOS 10, the automation may only work for what's in 9.2. And that's, there's nothing you can do about that because that's... But, but again, this is outside of, of this exactly, presentation. Exactly. This is Selenium. This is just how to use as Selenium on the Selenium, grid. As soon as Selenium yeah. will support these new features... It will work automatically. Will work no, automatically. no changes are necessary on your part if you follow this. And basically, you create your own uh, cloud right here on all these doors because you have a server or multiple servers that you want. Connect to them, uh, connect them between themselves. You have a multiple browsers, no, and you can actually uh, hit them and the server the client, in the yeah, same time. Browsers. So you said, I have 10 browsers. Right, that was my question about doing all these things with different browsers. So I think we're yeah. done with the presentation. I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I understand. All right. The question was, we saw only one resources his particular company, and then what he does. Docker. Is that thing Q&A. No. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah, so I just I can. Well, Do you want me to show the last four slides? Some, uh, does it, it, well, they're online. So right? They're online. Yeah, right. and they do like they automate it or they do like manual and they have all kinds of devices. There were no questions. Yes. I'm assuming yeah, more people will this watch it after the fact. Well, no, no, I don't know. It was a very well. <laughs> they may get bored the first 10 minutes. You can always speed it up. Yeah, you can always. Yeah. 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 I often do. Yeah. Then manual just for different kinds. So, okay. Or maybe as soon as they have a... Usually during...